let's actually talk about pirate clothing. So, a few of you on Facebook and YouTube have expressed interest in a more in-depth video uh, covering more of the sources and specific images, all of that. Uh, this video will be partially that. I make clothing professionally. For me to go in-depth with each piece is going to be a video in itself, and yes, those are incoming. I want to treat this as an introduction. One of the words that we encounter a lot, especially in the maritime context, is the term slop or slops. The slop contract applied to all ready-made clothing that would have been available for sale or as part of your pay on a ship, usually a navy ship. If you were in a city, you could go to a slop shop and get ready-made clothing. A lot of it would have been a general size. It would not have been tailored to you. And it would have been cheap. The materials would have been questionable, but it got the job done. Uh, sometimes people will read, oh, the slop contract, they're talking about the uniform. They're not talking about a uniform. A sailor getting pressed into the Navy would have been wearing whatever they had on. And as stuff wore out over time or they decided, you know, I don't really want to mess this up, they would start getting into the slops, which would have been jacket, would have been shirt, would have been stockings, would have been shoes, would have been hats. We luckily have the 1690 slop contract, which is very general, and the 1706 slop contract still around. What we're used to seeing is the wide collars, usually laced or in the front, maybe buttons. Sometimes it's short sleeved, sometimes they're long sleeved. actually don't know where some of those shirts come from. It's not the 17th century. Uh, were there wide collars in the 17th century? Yes. Were they part of the shirt? Usually no. In the 1706 slop contract, we have mention of blue checks. Let me bring this closer. The blue check fabric was so popular that a hundred years later, it was shirts made from this material was still being issued to the British military. Did it probably go through changes? Yes. Do we have actual evidence of what those changes were? Sadly, no. So this sort of shirt would not have this sort of pattern would not have been out of place. But, this pattern would be out of place. Notice the collar. This is actually a shirt for the American Revolution. The shirts at this time, we have several, there are several treatises on patterns. There are several surviving examples. Most of the shirts from most of the 17th century, well into the early 18th century, are very different. I typically go with just a white shirt. They were common enough. This is the collar. So here. Notice the difference. <laughs> The cuffs are the same, collars are different. Uh, most of your 18th century shirts will have added reinforcements. The 17th century examples typically don't have that.
to many of us, even those of us who are fairly well read as historians, what is described, what is defined as a waistcoat varies differently between the 17th century and the 19th century. There's a little transition going on in the 18th century where the word starts to change its meaning. So, a lot of times when new reenactors come up to me, I have to really be careful what word I use. When we think of a waistcoat or waistcoat right now, most of the time we're picturing a vest. No sleeves comes to about the waist. When you're reading the 1706 slop contract, the item that is actually being described, and it goes in, it's one of the few, I love the 1706 slop contract because it actually gets into detail. The problem is, it doesn't tell much otherwise. So, this is the jacket that I wore in the last video. If you've not seen that video, I feel free to pause and watch it. It's only three minutes. They say a yard long. Specifically, a yard long. We're lucky. A yard has not changed much. There might have been slight variation between tailors, people who, you know, it's supposed to be 36 inches, but we want to conserve fabric a little. So it might be 34 inches. Well, this one I made sure is the correct length. It describes black buttonhole thread. It describes black buttons. Now this is where it starts to get interesting. We have plenty of metal buttons surviving. We have plenty of images that show cloth cover buttons surviving. Up until very recently, we didn't really, we couldn't figure out what they meant by black buttons. We still don't even know. So even what I'm saying right here, it is my interpretation of what they mean. So, when I was doing the research, I'm like, okay, could they be japanned, which means painted black, it goes off of the black lacquer, then what would they have been made of? Just so happened one of the wrecks from Northern Europe produced horn buttons. Now, up until that time, a lot of, a lot of pirate historians, well, those didn't exist at the time. Nope, we found documentation, well, not documentation, we found the actual physical artifact of them existing in this time period. Am I right in going with this? We don't know. We cannot definitely say. This is a best guess. It mentions white linen lining. That's very specific. That's very easy to find. It mentions it being striped. Now, some of the vi some of the drawings I've seen from different art different artworks in modern books, they went with a blue stripe. Uh, some of the later striped waistcoats are blue striped. We don't actually know. I went with red only because red and gray were the predominant colors in the slop contract. It mentions 18 buttons, but it does not say if they go on pockets, if they go on cuffs, they don't say how they're laid out, just 18 buttons. So I went with 12 buttons on the front and three on the cuff. The reason I did that? A lot of the images show that sort of balance. Could it have been 10 on the front, 4 on the cuff? Perhaps. Could it have been 1 on the cuff, and then a whole bunch on the pockets, and then maybe 2 on the front? That would not make sense in the time period, but there is no definite on that. One of the images we do have of actual English sailors wearing... A jacket comes from a front piece for the Royal Navy, I believe dated 
1696. If I am wrong, I will put a little correction somewhere. If I'm right, I'll let it stand. This is what it's portraying. Now keep in mind, this is 1706 versus... Now, in several of the slop contracts, there's mention of brass buttons. I went with brass for this jacket. There's no pockets on it, and if you notice, the skirt is attached separately. There's something wrong with that, though. That style is earlier. But, it's appearing in official documentation in the 1690s. Now, there is the chance that whoever did the engraving was wrong. But there's a few other items here and there that do fit other descriptions, such as the checked petticoat breeches. Those are very specific. A uh, few people have interpreted them as kilts. They're not kilts. They're petticoat breeches. Hold that thought. We'll get to that. There's more to that one. Now, I was... I didn't doubt the image so much, but I knew others probably would. Uh, we have a wreck, the Archangel Raphael, which was worked on by Russian archaeologists. It's from about the 1720s, and it portrays... It has a jacket which is of the Dutch style from, I've seen similar jackets from about 1650 in that range. But here's one fairly, it would have been newer at that point in time, being worn in the 1720s. <coughs> A great thing about that jacket is, it has buttons made out of leather, which up until recently we didn't really, were another item that we were like, do they exist? It makes sense for them to exist. We only had known about them from later 18th century artifacts. Sure enough, there they are. On a jacket which, if you were to just look at it as a clothing historian, you'd be, oh, that's the wrong time period. Nope. <laughs> in the context of history, in the proper archaeological context, there it is. Returning again to slops, most often the word is used, even by historians, to refer to petticoat breaches, specifically petticoat over breaches. If you look at pictures of the Continental Navy, for instance, in that time period, the American Revolution, you will see images of breaches being worn over other breaches. I actually put a picture up. They were not worn as a first layer trousers or breeches. They were worn basically as clothing to protect the clothing underneath. When talking about the 17th and early 18th century, forget anything I just said. Petticoat breeches were worn by all classes. And they were worn, another term for them would be open knee breeches. So, here you go. Notice the knees. They're open. Why are they open? Honestly, it's good airflow. That's my assumption. If anybody has some specific reason that they have found, other than style, go for it. But, you see them, you see an evolution of them throughout the 17th century. Uh, there's earlier styles which are similar. It, it's 
like I said, this I could go on for hours talking about this. We're going to try to keep this fairly short. In the Navy fronts piece that I mentioned before, they're wearing checked petticoat breeches. People think they're kilts. They're not. These would have been worn, again, by all classes. Sometimes they would have been tucked into the socks, the stockings. Other times they'd just be worn open. And again, let me repeat, they are seen by men, being worn by many different people of many different materials. I just made a post the other day on, on my group's page and I'm like, guys, don't use canvas for them. Use anything but canvas for them. The reason being, even though they probably more than likely were made from canvas at various points, the reason being a lot of people have the wrong idea of what they are. Their comfort. <laughs> so here's actually an example I converted into closed knee breeches. Same material actually. You could do that. Uh, which gets into trousers. Now I sadly do not have an example here right now because every time I make them I end up selling them. This gets into the topic of visual sources. Specific, well, very importantly, visual sources. Uh, a lot of what we know about pirates, and that I'm saying as historians, what we know they look like, is probably wrong, again. <laughs> but comes from the Dutch prints that were in the general history of pirates by Charles Johnson. We know that these were done in the Netherlands. Now, the thing is, the Netherlands have always been very connected to the sea. There's a very good chance that whoever did those did know what a British sailor looked like. More than likely, it's seen plenty of British sailors, merchantmen, everything. We cannot completely discredit them. There's several images, there's a style of trousers where there's a basically a cargo pocket. We see those in earlier images. Now, were they... Did sailors wear them? I would argue yes. This gets into how do we interpret things that we cannot confirm. Well, later sailors in about the mid-18th century, there's accounts of them taking those overbreaches and actually having them retailored to fit better. And you see the same effect of ankle-length, shin-length trousers. They're comfortable. I will tell you that. I've the ones I've made, they're comfortable. Uh, they're a lot more practical. They don't get caught in anything. There's a trend I see with the bucket boots. Uh, bucket boots may have been worn by buccaneers. They were within a time period, especially the early ones of the English Civil War. They were a fashion trend at the time. There's also various over, I wouldn't call them overshoes, basically gaiters that replicated the look. But would, ha would sailors have worn them? We don't have any documentation that they did. We do have documentation of various, for lack of a better term, fishing boots among Dutch sailors. We also have an image, I believe, from the Spanish of similar boots. They would have been worn most likely in rough weather. Think of them like uh, modern day uh, 
wellies. So, what we do have documentation for are boots and shoes. Well, not really boots. Shoes like these. We have them from the Witter Wreck. We have fragmentary examples all over the world. We have images that show it. They would have either been laced or buckled. Now, would there have been anything else special about them? We're not sure. What we do have documentation on are buccaneer shoes. Now, as I said in my Don't Eat the Leather short, these are technically wrong. They would not have been treated pigskin. It would have been raw pigskin. It would have come from the leg. The descriptions, there's a tradition that goes later on in the Caribbean of doing the same thing. They would have been ugly. But they would have worked. The Buccaneers, I will say, we have a lot more information because some of what they did was weird. It was weird enough that writers took note. So, the jacket, the coat made from, there's a description of sackcloth, but I've also heard sailcloth. In that time period, that's one of those words that could be used different ways. More than likely, it was heavy canvas, really rough canvas, and they dyed it, and it was described as dyeing it with indigo. They were doing this in the field. This was not a professional operation. That's why when I've done it, I've just quickly dipped it in, the, in indigo dye, pulled it back out, boom. It's blue. It works. It's very unlikely it would have been over-dyed. Could it have been? Again, that's a specific that we don't know. We don't know what button, what type of buttons they used. I use basic wood cord cloth cover buttons. It would have been something they could have easily made in the field or had available. They could have easily just taken metal buttons off older clothing. One of the descriptions, again with the Buccaneers, is using a hide, hair on hide for equipment. Hence, this. Now, this gets back into the don't eat the leather. It's very hard to find veg tanned hair on hide leather. Does, is it out there? Yes. But I don't really want to spend the kind of money for it just for an experiment. When I was doing, when I got the hide, I the big tipping point for me, as somebody who studies Henry Every, was in the engravings, he's portrayed with a pouch in the very front of his belt. A friend of mine was looking at it and he goes, you know, that's that looks like hair on hide. I'm like, that's interesting. So I started looking more at pouches. I went back to the Buccaneers. So one thing is very important to do, if you see something that you think's later, try to find something earlier. If you can't find anything in the gap, try to find something earlier that shows that the style carried on. So in some of the images of the Buccaneers, there's also a hanging pouch. And these were almost 100% made out of hair on hide leather. So, I replicated it. Uh, there's later styles which are very similar where the straps in the back. There's a few of the images from the Buccaneers which seem to show similar. But they're flat. They're not a box. Hats are another topic which are often wrong. They're usually depicted as leather cocked hats, sometimes really outrageous cocked hats, sometimes bicorns, which are of a lot are of a much later style. 
This is a hat I typically wear. It's just partially cocked on one side, partially cocked on the others. It's a working hat. This style would have been worn throughout much of the later part of the 17th century into the early 18th century. An item that we see in the slop contract are the reference of leather caps. We didn't know what this word meant for the longest time until I started doing some digging into different boating hats and other soft caps of the time period. This is my best guess on how the slop contract leather caps would have looked. There's also a style which is plain leather, doesn't mention anything about the red, just white thread, but it's an ugly hat, but we see them in the 17th century and also later in the 18th century. Uh, and of course, the Mawmouth cap, which is one of the oldest continually used hat styles. Uh, honestly, being a, growing up as a punk street kid, this is, yeah, <laughs> I like this one better. Uh, you do see some really ornately decorated hats among the upper class. If you're a pirate, yeah, you can steal them. Go for it. This will blow off in the wind. This doesn't. And this doesn't either. There are a few other styles which, when I get into, when I do a hat video, we will discuss them. So. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, share, get more people involved in the channel. Uh, I am going, like I said, I am going to do more videos where we get specifically into individual items of clothing and discuss more in depth on them. Uh, waistcoats, I've left out a huge chunk that we can talk about, and that's just waistcoats. That's not just the cores, frock coats, things like that. So, take care, have a great day.